a lot of people dash into writing and they assume that they should be novelists or that they should be screenplay writers because those are the hot areas. But it's only when you ask yourself honestly, what gets me curious? What do I want to know more about? What do I end up exploring? That you'll know the kind of writer that you are. Welcome to episode two of the Window Pane Sessions. Window Pane is a writing community which has been formed by students of my online writing course, The Art of Clear Writing, which is linked below. We give each other exercises and feedback. We have a reading club. We have a newsletter for which we write at windowpane.substack.com, and we have the Window Pane Sessions where we soak up gyan from noted writers on the art and craft and practice of writing. And our guest today in the Window Pane Sessions is the noted writer and critic Nilanjana Roy. Uh, Nilanjana. Now, welcome to Window Pane. I'm so happy to be part of this. I mean, thank you so much for asking me to join you and uh, you know your students, fellow writers, and really looking forward to talking to people. I have to warn you though that I've spent the last uh, eight hours pretty much writing and working on edits, so I might be tremendously incoherent. But if you ask me to type, I'm fine. Yeah, no worries about that. I think just for all the viewers as well, the structure of today is that I will have a brief conversation with Nilanjana, and when I say brief, I mean brief, like five minutes or so. This is for those who are used to the seen and the unseen. Brief there means only two hours, and uh, after that, Nilanjana is going to share some of her, her thoughts on the writing process with all of us, and then the participants will one by one uh, ask questions, which I'm really uh, uh, looking forward to. It's all about the art and craft of writing today. I want. To start actually not by asking you about writing itself, but about reading. Like one of the things that I uh, admire about you and envy about you almost is what a good reader you are. And obviously, you know, before we become writers, we become uh, readers. And and uh, you know, so, so so tell me a bit about you know how you became a reader to begin with. How did your love affair with books uh, begin in a way? I thought I was going to be an astronaut actually. uh the other thing that i wanted to do was to uh ride camels across south asia these were my two ambitions when i was 3 but when i was about 4 i was introduced to books in the way that you are in a bengali household which is that they're lying scattered around you badger some relative and uh, it patiently shows you that letters may make words and i think for me it was just the an amazing revelation that these things that i had considered bricks and you know part of the wall were actually filled with stories and more than that the sense of power that you have as a 4 year old when you realize that you can open up a book and read your own stories you don't have to hang around waiting for a grown up to show up catch it by the pajama leg and force it to tell you stories maybe you can have your own I'm joking here but actually uh I love it that you said that writers begin as readers first. I think in modern times maybe that isn't as true as in our decade this isn't as true a lot of people just jump into writing for out of the love of telling a story but at some level you're always reading you know even if you're not reading novels even if you're not reading magazines and books this generation is reading constantly on their phones on texts and tablets. but the books that you read in your childhood are the ones that i suspect actually form you as a writer those stories are powerful you know we don't just um, read them politely at a little bit of a distance the way we do as adults but uh, they become in a strange way part of your own imagination like your family and the neighborhood that you grew up in and i cunningly engineered a life where i got paid for reading books and to the same day proud of that <laughs> Yep. Can you tell us about uh, you know some formative books from your childhood that you really remember or that made a mark on uh, you or that you go back to? I remember them so clearly. There was a mix of things. Uh, there was Grimm's fairy tales in an old edition with illustrations that were nightmarish because it was printed in a time when people. Uh, you know didn't pay much attention to the fact that children would look at monsters and think that those monsters were literally living under your bed or coming at you through the window but they were also fascinating and they sucked you in there were the soviet books i remember that clearly this was a time when uh india and russia 
were very close uh, together, both in uh, political terms and in trade terms. What that worked out to was this extraordinary phenomenon of book ships coming across from Soviet Russia to India, and literally dumping books by the kilo into this unprepared Indian market. So we all grew up reading things about the young pioneers and Olga Perevskaya's Kids and Cubs, which was about a young girl and her family bringing up animals in a remote part of Russia. And we read political allegories like The Three Fat Men, which was about the revolt of an acrobat against the three extremely corrupt men who ran the government. And that seeped into my DNA as well. And of course, there were Bengali fairy tales, which were full of uh, rakshases and uh, flying princes and stuff like that. So it was a little bit of a mix. I only discovered Hindi later, much to my regret, but uh, Hindi came to me more in terms of rhymes and songs and poems. It was pretty eclectic. Yeah, you use the phrase book ships and that sounds something like uh, that sounds like something out of a fantasy novel. Book ships is such a almost a, a romantic notion there. Of course, one could cynically say that, hey, we don't need book ships. Uh, sub cloud mein hai, as Vishwabandhu Gupta Ji would say. Um, but, but again, continuing with sort of reading and the transition to becoming a writer, I remember an old interview of Arundhati Roy after she'd won the Booker Prize. And maybe you did the interview. I don't remember who did it, uh, where she said that when she became a writer the quality of her reading changed you know which obviously sort of uh, implies that the reading became much more mindful as a writer she began to notice what they were doing with their language the tricks that they were using the way they were structuring their stories and so on and so forth was there a shift for you also uh, when that kind of mindful uh, reading began to happen did that sort of change the way that you looked at the books that you read Kim, that's such a good question. It, it could only come from somebody who is a writer himself. But I think reading for me shifted twice over. First was when in my 20s, I joined the Business Standard and I became a book reviewer. And for the first time outside of school, we were taught, of course, in class 11 and 12, how to dissect a book and criticize it in those terms. But what you're doing as a book reviewer is really you're kind of a shadow reader for the reader, you know. So you're writing for an audience of people who haven't yet read the book. And the value of what you do is not telling them whether they should read it or not. It's not the judgment. It's at some level, you've got to convey a little bit of the experience of reading the book. Yeah. Um, and that changed my perspective slightly because I wasn't looking for the tricks that uh, writers use at that point, the techniques. But I was looking at how do they make this story successful? Or if there's a point of time at which you step back from a novel and you're like, I'm, I'm not sure that I buy that, what failed, you know? Uh, you're looking at the mechanism, but you're also looking at something simple as a reviewer. Does this world work? You know, is it magic or not? Is it true? Are we completely inside it or is some part of us still stepped outside being a little skeptical? Then when I became a writer and I came to writing both very early and very late, I'd been writing short stories, plays, and uh, really, really bad poetry, you know, all through my teenage years. But I'd never imagined that I would be a writer until, to my surprise, at 37, I became one by writing The Wildings and The Hundred Names of Darkness. And by that time, I knew I was going to be a writer only in my 30s when I did find that I was reading books differently. And the question I was asking each time is, you read something and you think that's magic or you'd be weeping your eyes out, you know, at the, mm -hmm. uh, what, the fate that befell some character you loved. And part of you would be cold-bloodedly thinking, that's damn good. How, how did she do it? Can I, can I see that? <laughs> <laughs> you're reading as a thief, actually. You know, when you're reading as a writer, you're reading partly in tribute. And partly envy is about the highest praise that you can give another writer when you say, I don't know how you did that. That's the way I feel about a lot of the old uh, school writers, Toni Morrison, Garcia Marquez. It's not just how did you do that, as in, you know, not just the sentences or the chapters or the imagination. What you're really saying at that point is, how did you make me feel this way? You know? And uh, that still remains powerful magic for me. 
Yeah, before we get on to your writing process, uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, participants, uh, Ela, left a question for you, but she couldn't make it herself because her laptop lap laptop broke down. So I am uh, so I'll ask the question on her behalf, and it's to do with reading, which is why I'm asking it now. So uh, we'll move on from this now. And Ela's question is, quote. How did you build your ability to read so many books so fast without compromising on retention slash deep thinking? Uh, stop quote. And and the background for this is that uh, you know when I uh, uh, told all these guys that I've invited Nilanjana Roy, one of the things that I did mention is that she is the most well-read person that I uh, know and all of that. And and this is a question I also get, though I don't read as much as you do remotely. But uh, you know, is there a trade-off between reading a lot and uh, actually? Uh, sort of reading deeply and uh, thinking about what you're reading and retaining that, and also, if I may add to that, uh, for a significant period of time, reading books was actually part of your job when you had to review books. Mm -hmm. So, did that ever feel like uh, a drudgery? Uh, you know, so you know, how have you? Uh, how did you deal with that? These are again, you know, a string of linked, connected, but very good questions and. I don't think it's that difficult a skill to acquire. If you think about it, lawyers read as much in terms of volume. Uh, business administrators often uh, go through thick files and thick reports. And so it's a knack that anybody can pick up, uh, whether you're trying uh, looking at it at the strictly mechanical sense of speed reading. The question of what you'll retain is a tricky one. You know, often I read a lot less than I had to at one point of time. Um, there was a stage where I think I was reading close to 40, 50 books a month, um, and that does tire you out. That tires you out for a strange reason. It's not that the books tire you out. Um, it's not that your stamina goes, but you're at great risk of becoming cynical. And also, if you're reading that much in the present, then by implication, you're not reading as much as you should in the past. Uh, for me, what happened was when I was reading that much, I didn't feel that it was a chore or drudgery, except I'm going to be tactless here, but sometimes, you know, if you're reading uh, a lot of fiction that isn't very well written, then yeah, <laughs> you know, you're not happy. You're not terribly happy about it. But there's always the books that surprise you. There's always the books that come out of nowhere and you're looking at them and falling in love with them again. But at that time, I was compromising on the amount of reading I wanted to do in other languages. Uh, I, I've always read in Bengali as well. And I just picked up Hindi again. I just picked up Sanskrit again. And somehow to read too much in one language when you're part of this country, it makes you lopsided. <laughs> I, I can't explain it better than that. But, you, you know, if you have a bilingual or trilingual mind, and mine halts a little bit in Hindi, it's fluent in Bangla, and it's very comfortable in English and Bangla both. But you feel like you're only imagining with a little part of your mind then, all right? How do you develop this skill? It's very easy. It's not just book reviewers who have it. If you think about it, every editor, you know, every publisher has the ability to read it. What we don't talk about, and uh, this is where a certain amount of uh, um, trade secrets are going to be revealed, is that after a while you develop the literary agent, publisher, editor skill, you can pretty much pick up a book, read the first three chapters, read the middle of it, and know not whether the book is good or bad, but you'll know whether the author was confident in what they were doing. Uh, you can smell a good but promising first draft that needs some work from a book that maybe hasn't taken that many drafts, but that has been polished and thought about and really well imagined. You know, sometimes uh, some skilled agents and editors can pretty much tell that from the first page, and they're very rarely wrong. You know, because you're reading so much, you're living, if you think about it, you're living in a stream of story. Um, it always felt like a privilege, even now when I still uh, write a book column for the Financial Times. And I do read as widely as I can. What you're haunted by is the fear of missing out on something that you should have read. And also, in so many languages, and they're being translated more and more widely these days. And in a way, you know, you, you don't know how to keep up with the great books that are being written in India, around the world. And then how do you keep up with the past? 
you're always having to choose. That's the part of it that's difficult, having to make decisions about what you then read privately. And how did your multilingual reading affect your writing in English when you got down to it? Because like you said, you you, you, you would read in Bengali. Uh, you uh, picked up your uh, habit of reading in Hindi once you settled down to uh, settle down in Delhi uh, somewhat later. Uh, you know, uh, and all of these languages are different in fundamental ways with different conventions and different sort of value systems uh, embedded within them. So is there an influence of all, um, you know, your language reading, so to say, uh, which you bring into what you write in English? At the most superficial level, I guess it's there in the wildings and the names of characters. Um, I remember struggling with this a little bit for the German edition because the German publisher asked not unreasonably to change the name of Qatar to Dagger and, uh, you know, Hulo to Tomcat and Biral to Cat. And uh, we had to bargain a little bit and come up with acceptable names that conveyed the sense of the original in German. Uh, I, it's always felt, uh, it felt like an enhancement. I think to my sadness, I don't know Hindi well enough to either speak it with the kind of fluency that I would like. I, I love that language a little hopelessly, you know, a permanent outsider to it as a Bengali. But uh, it it will it's very Gurudat, you know. It <laughs> it is very Gurudat with Wahida Rahman. I look at it and I say, um, you know, you will always be there up in the sky, illuminating my path that's so far away, you know. Um, but in a more serious way, I don't think I can imagine writing in English without the shadow of Banga and Hindi behind me. It's uh, it halted me for a while in my thirties when I first started to try to write a more ambitious novel, I kind of abandoned it because I could not figure out how to uh, convey people's conversation, you know. I did not want to do a translation from Hindi to English or from Bengali to English. And yet in my head, they were clearly not speaking English. And it took me some time to understand that you don't have to translate and you don't have to betray one language for the other. You just have to listen to the way that person speaks. You know, everyone has a tone and intonation, a rhythm. And so long as you, in fact, you avoid a direct translation, you can bring the flavor of that over. How successful or not that's been, I don't know. It will only be put to the test when my next novel, Black River, comes out in a year or so. <laughs> so. And- uh, and, you know, I remember maybe 15 years ago when uh, we both met as sort of bloggers, uh, when you used to write uh, Kitab Khana as Hari Babu. And uh, uh, I remember uh, at one point me haranguing you that why don't you write fiction? Why don't you write novels? You're the, you know, the best read person I know. Your insights <laughs> on literature are so amazing. And uh, uh, your response at that time, if I remember correctly, and forgive me if my uh, memory is uh, inaccurate here, but your response was that you read so much great literature that uh, you were intimidated by that, that you thought, how can I write anything that can ever belong to that, you know, but eventually you sort of got past that and, um, um, uh, uh, you know, ended up becoming a, a writer yourself. And I have a question on that because I uh, love this quote from, um, uh, you know, an essay you wrote in uh, The Girl Who Ate Books, uh, where uh, you, you, you spoke about how you first started uh, writing and you write, quote, I tried to write something more serious and literary. There was a story about a butcher who had come over into Delhi at the time of the Bangladesh war. But every time I tackled it, the butcher's life stayed flat and dead on the page. I did not like people who talked about the process of being a writer or said writer with a capital W because storytelling is such a basic human skill. Everyone has it once they acquire language. But I was beginning to face the fact that while I knew my reading tastes very well, I knew nothing about what I might be like as a writer. Uh, stop quote. And this is a good segue into a question asked by another of the participants um, here who could not be in person. So he asked me to ask the question for him, Chintan Patel. And Chintan asked, quote, given your prolific reading, were you wary of being able to find your unique voice when you decided to write? When flooded with so much volume of others writing and ideas, is it a challenge to find your own unique voice? Uh, stop quote. I mean, through such a generous interview, and trust an old friend to remember something like this. I was intimidated. I'd read great books in so many different languages, and I've been reading those all my life. And, 
you know, you grew up with the shadow of a Rushdi or an Anandhati Roy very much with you. And then at some point, what was liberating for me was realizing that I didn't have to write a great book. In fact, I could spend a life as a writer uh, fading miserably uh, to write a great book and I could still, I was still allowed to be a writer. I was still allowed um, to find a story that I really cared about. Uh, the books that I ended up writing, I guess The Wildings and The Hundred Names of Darkness, part one is uh, something that doesn't surprise anyone who knows me. Uh, the love I have for cats and street animals, uh, strays particularly, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to see whether I could write from the perspective of something non-human. It was a challenge. And the biggest challenge actually turned out to be compressing time because uh, cats live much shorter lives than humans do. And trying to find a way to uh, convey that drove me mad until I realized I only had to feel it. I didn't actually have to you know, try to put it out on the page. But behind that, there was that big story and I did end up writing a about a butcher, though he ended up being a minor character in someone else's story. That's the way it transforms and changes. I think when you start out writing, you don't really know who you are as a writer. That question about voice, I think I worried about it too much in my 20s. I worried that I was over-influenced or that I would write sounding like somebody I admired greatly and not myself. And the fact is you're going to be influenced at any point of time by whatever it is that you love most. You might have grown up, you know, just watching films obsessively or even sport or music or whatever. All of that can seep into your writing and honestly it should. When I finally started to write for myself, it was through little bursts. I, I have literally a drawer full of failed stories and poems uh, and when I call them failed, actually, I like that word, failed. It means you tried, you know. I don't think they are good stories because they worked only to get me to a point, but they got me onto the road. And to my surprise, I had a voice on and on. I just needed to find it. That's it. It didn't even have to be a good voice or a great voice or anything. It just had to be my own. Initially, when you start out, maybe you do start out a little innovative. But sooner or later, you realize you can write whatever writer. I mean, who's your favorite writer? Just name two writers off the bat whom you greatly admire. Alice Munro and Yoko Ogawa to, you know, think of two living Ogawa. writers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you started to write, you know, Haunted by Their Shadow, you might be able to produce maybe a page or two, maybe even a chapter in that key. And then after that, trust me, it would come back to your voice. You can't write like somebody else. You can only write like you. And when I realized that it was liberating, I was worrying too much about, you know, the finished book or what would people say or what would people think. And all of that fell away when I was finally faced with the book itself and the characters and the world and the people. At that point, you don't care. You're just trying to get, not even get that right, but you're fascinated by what's going on there, you know? And all your doubts disappear. You're just into the writing. Oh, oh God, I, I did it. I did it. I did writer with a capital W. I did writing with a capital W. Yeah, we will not We will not edit that out. It is there for posterity. In fact, we'll make a separate five-second clip of you doing that and put that on YouTube and look at what she did. Uh, you know, I could, I could just keep asking you questions for a couple of hours, but many others have mm -hmm. questions to ask. And we are also very keen to see your slideshow and uh, uh, the insights that you're going to share with us. So I will now make you a host so you can share your wow. uh, slideshow. That sounds so fancy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. When I say I'll make you a host, it almost sounds like I'm passing on a virus. Pandemics, one sec. Mm. Hi, this presentation is called Writing Life and How to Enjoy It because I, I tried to set down rules for writing and I, I've never liked reading rules for writing. You know, they always sound so minatory and so you must do as I say. But what I thought you might like is basically just a little walk through how you get from wanting to be a writer to setting up a full practice. So the basics, 
these are the tools that I actually found useful. A lot of people would say that what you need to be a writer is something like, you know, notebooks and pens so that you can journal every day or a program like Scrivener, which I have found very useful when I'm novel writing. But ultimately, to my surprise, this was a list of things that I ended up using most in my career as a writer. What I've done so far as a writer isn't all that much. I wrote a couple of fantasy novels called The Wildings and the Girl Who Ate Books, uh, The Wildings and the Hundred Names of Darkness, a collection of essays called The Girl Who Ate Books. And I've edited several anthologies, the most recent of which was Patriots, Poets and Prisoners, an anthology of writings from the 19th, 20th century journal, The Modern Review. When I started my own career as a writer, and I look back at it, in my 20s, I was both a journalist and a blogger. I became a columnist, an editor, and a novelist eventually. But these were the things that led me into my practice. Curiosity, if you don't have this, you might want to ask yourself why you want to write in the first place. Curiosity is not just the thing that leads you into talking to people, figuring out the world. It's also something that if you're willing to take it as far as it can go, it can tell you what kind of writer you want to be. A lot of people dash into writing and they assume that they should be novelists or that they should be screenplay writers because those are the hot areas. But it's only when you ask yourself honestly, what gets me curious? What do I want to know more about? What do I end up exploring? That you'll know the kind of writer that you are. Open mind, open heart. This sounds so touchy-feely, you know, a little bit like uh, it is actually from my meditation practice. But when I began writing, I found that often I was trying to write characters who came from very different worlds that I was used to. And I was not that interested in writing about my own world, whether I was writing about cats or whether I was writing about people who lived by the Yamuna River. Approaching all of them with a completely open mind, saying, I don't know what your world is like, but if I am patient and if I listen with an open heart, will you tell me or will you show me how to do the research? Clarity. People talk a lot about um, how to get your writing and your craft to work for you in a book. But I think this is the ultimate goal of a lot of great writing. It doesn't matter whether you come to it through a complicated book or a more simple way of working. But ultimately, you are trying, if not to write a clear sentence or a clear paragraph, you are trying to make something clear to the reader that is sharp in your own mind, but that the reader doesn't know about. And patience and stubbornness, you're going to need both. It takes a lot of patience to take a book from an idea in your head to becoming a final novel, and stubbornness just helps with everything else. Often when we are talking about a writing practice, you know, it's also serious. It's also, you have to sit down and do six hours worth of this and eight hours worth of that. But actually, this was the skill that meant the most to me, playfulness. So often, it's been times when I've been actually drifting sideways. I was writing op-eds for the New York Times, but there was this germ of a story coming out. And I didn't know where it was going to lead me, but I gave myself permission when I'd finished work to sit down and drift, even though it was unproductive, even though there was nothing concrete that I could look at and say, this makes sense. This is going to be good for my career. So absolutely, you don't drift. And by that, what I mean is, instead of planning out your career too strongly, follow your curiosity, but also give yourself moments when you've switched your brain off and then see what rises to the fore. Try different kinds of writing. This, If there was one bit of advice that I would give most Indians who are coming into writing, it is really this. Typically, what we do is we look at the market and we say, okay, mythological novels are coming up. Or we say, Chetan Bhagat's kind of writing, I want to write a book like that. Or I want to write a novel that wins the booker. But you don't know what you actually are good at and you don't know what you like. Before I became a novelist, which is what I've 
I'm committing to being for the next five years or so, uh, the kinds of writing that I had done varied from the book reviews and the edits and all of that that you know about. But I had also tried my hand at writing a few plays. I had written a little bit of poetry, uh, thankfully, mercifully unpublished, because that was one of the lines that shut down for me. I tried writing a lot of nonfiction. I played with the essay form until I realized that it didn't work for me. But try different things and then settle on one. This one, it sounds, um, the writing life is the creative life. By that, all I mean to tell you is that Writing is not separate from your life. In every area of your life as it stands, the more that you learn to be playful, to create, whether you're cooking or gardening, whether you're out there exercising or something, you know, creativity is not an external quality. And creativity stems from letting go of what you think you should be as an adult, as a writer, which is often very serious. One of the best poets I knew, Aga Shahid Ali, was a man who was eternally playful. And his playfulness led him to discover and reinvent, in some ways, old forms like the ghazal, uh, the canzoni, which is an Italian verse form, because he had this talent. And what he did with it was basically throw it up like balls in the air, juggling them all over the place. Me change your friend. Even if you've written a best-selling book, don't stick with that formula. You're going to be in this for a lifetime. And go out, challenge yourself. You're at the start of your practices. Challenge yourself to go out every three years or so and do something new. When I wrote this, I was sitting there and saying what I really noticed about my own life is that it wasn't when I was comfortable that I did my best work. It was usually when I was either taking a risk or when I was doing something that made me deeply unsure of myself. The moment I walked out of my comfort zone, I actually produced work that was worthwhile. The second part of the practice, space. There are four elements to this. Your time is the most important thing. As much as we talk about writing, as much as we say, yes, it would be lovely to do this and do that and the other, until you commit a certain amount of time, every day, every week, every month, you'll get back to that. Um, you actually have to write to be a writer and you have to, I hope, enjoy spending that time. In the beginning, when you're starting out, it can be difficult to get into the habit of writing a little bit every day. You're sitting there facing a blank page and saying, what do I write? And I'm sure that you know if you've taken Amit's course, then you'd have gone through a few exercises. But it always helps to get to the habit of just showing up at the desk, whatever agreement you've made with yourself. You know, just show up at the desk, sit down, and wait in the stillness and see what comes to you. A writing space. I put this on the list because, uh, again, in my 20s, I thought that you needed an ideal writing life in order to write. I thought what you needed was a beautiful study with a view of something gorgeous, and you needed peace and quiet and a desk to yourself. I've done almost all of my writing at kitchen tables and at dining tables. It turned out that all I really needed was the space, to the point where now that I have a desk of my own, I very rarely use it because I'm so used to writing at the dining table with uh, you know, cats around me or people cooking in my kitchen or friends wandering by. Freedom. If you notice one thing that's missing from this is money, that's because to me, Money is uh, not really that important. Of course, you need to earn enough to allow you the time to write. But if money was all it took to be a writer, then everybody who was wealthy would be churning out books. And as we know, as other people have said, they're not. But money is part of what will buy you freedom. A lot of people walk into the writing life and they're deeply disappointed because it can take time to make any money at all. It can be frustrating trying to get published. And the only advice I have to offer here is try and find a job that pays you well enough to do a certain amount of writing for free. Toni Morrison, whom we mentioned earlier when Amita and I were talking, she wrote in the early hours of the morning before she went off to her job as an editor. A lot of other writers basically sneak writing in between 
the usual stuff of life. But if you have a job, at least for the first few years that you're a writer, you're not putting pressure on your writing to pay the bills. And at a stage when you're just emerging as a writer, you're finding your voice, you're discovering the books that you want to write, right? And that's really important. In any decade, you're only going to be writing three or four books. It is important to know for sure before you commit to a book that this is the one that you're going to write. And the last thing you need is the pressure of, is my writing going to pay the bills for me? Ideally, get a job that allows you to coast through at least the first three to five years of your writing practice before you decide you're going to make a living as a writer. The second part of freedom, I think back to all the doubts that I had that kept me in place, kept me from writing. Those doubts were, I'm not good enough. Uh, all the great books have been written. I can't write a book like that, so maybe I shouldn't even try. And it didn't matter, actually. Um, what mattered was that I should feel free to write and that you should feel free to write. So give yourself that freedom right from the start. Give yourself freedom to fail. Give yourself freedom to succeed and to celebrate the successes. The last part on the list of space, quieting down. It really doesn't matter how beautiful your space is or whether you're sitting in a noisy coffee shop. Somewhere inside that practice of slowing down a little bit, getting stiller, and getting a little more silent, at least inside, so that you can hear what you really want to say. That is crucial. This one I'll move over through very fast, but it's something that I really believe that every writer needs to do, no matter whether you're a fiction writer or a nonfiction writer, a poet or a dramatist. Never forget your senses are so important because that's how you take in the world. And if you're not true to that, there's no way that you're going to be able to either reproduce or create a world of your own. Every now and then, stop writing and train yourself in any one of these. Learn how to listen. When you see, take a camera with you or draw, touch. It is so important to know how different characters might touch different parts of their world. Texture, taste. I won't linger on that, but uh, someday I'd love to teach a workshop on that. Uh, this. this took me uh, years to figure out for myself. I tried very hard to write every day because that's what a lot of the rules and a lot of the books said you should do. But it turned out that my writing rhythm was much more committing to writing each week for myself, but actually writing maybe for two days with a day's gap and then two days with a day's gap. That worked beautifully for me. You have a natural beat. You don't really know what it is. You might be a morning writer. You might be an evening writer. Uh, you might be somebody who can write only after making a few sketches. Or you might be somebody who plunges straight into the writing without needing notes. Whatever your rhythm is, it's particular to you. And when you find what works for you, just keep faith with yourself. Show up. Promise to do this every day. Imagination, again, this is not a skill. This is not something that just some people have and some people don't. It's very much a muscle. You can learn to train your imagination. All of us who were children who daydreamed or who read a book and then promptly added our own versions of the stories in it or who watched a film and said, but what if this character did that thing, you know? If you were creating your own versions of Star Wars when you watched the film for the first time, you already know how to imagine. You might be somebody who imagines more in the abstract vein. Whatever it is, keep working it. As much as actually working the writing, working the imagination is so important. This was a much more talky slide than I usually do, but I'm deadly serious about it. A lot of nonfiction writers decide that they don't really need to work the imagination. This is not true. When I've interviewed people uh, for the long form stories I used to do for the BBC or the New York Times or the Telegraph, it was one thing to you know, push a mic at somebody or a notebook at somebody and say, tell me how you feel about this protest. Why are you out there protesting? It's only when you slow down a little bit and you say, what is your life like now? How does this event affect you? How is it going to change your life? 
it's only when you stand in somebody's shoes that you should be writing about the impact on them you know you have to be able to reverse that a little bit not you have to treat anyone whom you're reporting on or whose lives you're reporting on with respect and part of that respect involves trying to imagine what made them the people they are and imagination also if you're working on larger non fiction projects allows you to recreate or reimagine a time that's not your own or a city or a country or past that's not your own fiction we already know uh, what imagination can do but um, it's not just characters it's not just world building one of the most powerful ways in which the imagination works is that at least for me i often see my entire novel before i even get down to outlining it or plotting it you know there'll be it will start with a visual a character whom i don't know nothing about and whom i don't understand and then that visual will blow grow and suddenly i will literally see the story of the entire book i know it as well as i know the lives of my friends and my sisters and brothers that is the imagination at work and then from then on my task is to do the nuts and bolts of structuring outlining getting it down on paper but often a book begins you see it whole or you see at least a significant part of it revision a lot of people think they can skip this but i changed my mind about the usefulness of writing drafts when i was working uh, you know doing multiple drafts we so eager to get to the finish line we so eager to get a book out there right but when you revise something you're revisioning it you're seeing it again with fresh eyes when you go over something you have written you see it the way a reader might see it and you look at that world and you think always one question that comes to me have i done justice to you of course and you shouldn't get stuck with endless revisions at some point a book is ready and it needs to be pushed out into the world and make its own way and you should not be overprotective you should let it go but it really helps very few pieces of work are perfect on the first take and it really helps to spend a little time with what you're making and love it this is the book that i've just finished uh there's a second uh, volume to this a uh, companion book this took four edits over six years i did not sit at a desk for six years <laughs> i spent a lot of that time doing long treks in the hills and going off to forests and you know playing infinite games of spelling bee or scrabble and cooking for friends and basically goofing off but i did spend a lot of that six years see to see writing and struggling to figure out what this book really was i thought it might be fun for you to just get a sense of how much the editing process can change a book black river is loosely speaking a thriller slow burning set in delhi and set in a village in the aravadi hills in haryana where a young child is murdered with rippling consequences in my first edit black river lost a major character it lost about 150 pages on a massive section that was set in art galleries and the art world and two characters i thought of as my minor one was a farmer and the other was a woman called rabia they started to dominate the book second edit i realized that there was a murder at the center of the novel and rather than being a plot device the murder started to move me and i began to spend a lot of time talking to police uh, the cops in haryana police stations i added 100 pages i cut 60 pages third edit i deleted three chapters to do with one character because i realized i'd been giving out back story it had nothing to do with the novel what i'd written was essential it was my way of understanding where this character came from and what mattered to her but it wasn't something that the reader needed to know and to my surprise the moment i took the three chapters out like water gushing up from the ground four chapters came out that actually brought her story closer together with the farmers and i added one more suspect which was tremendous fun also one more murder fourth edit i tightened and cleaned the book came out came down normally naturally and normally by 40 pages and i added 20 Thank you much for staying with this that's the end and i'd be happy to take 
uh, questions now. Well, that was an awesome presentation, Neela. Thank you so much for your uh, generosity in uh, uh, sharing all of that. Um, uh, you, you know, I'll be watching the recording later and processing all of it carefully. But for now, I think we should uh, head on over to the many people who had... Uh, uh, we should head on over to the many people who had questions to ask. And uh, we've divided the questions across uh, the, the, the various themes on which we are wait, uh, you know, eager to hear from you. You've already spoken about many of those themes, of course, but we've divided them ac thematically across reading, reviewing, writing, uh, publishing, and just uh, general advice on various things. So no one has asked a question with advice on, you know, cat grooming tips or something like <laughs> that, which is most disappointing and perhaps a subject on which you are global expert number one. Uh, but uh, uh, so um, uh, Raj has a question on uh, 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 Raj has a question on reading. So we'll uh, move to that first. <laughs> How nice to see you, Raj. Thank you so much for doing this, Nilanjana. Uh, Nilanjana, I wanted to ask you, uh, when writing about Arundhati Roy back in 2003, you spoke about a sense of continuity in her nonfiction writing. And I marveled at that statement because in a way, I sense that same sense of continuity in her essays, in her fiction, even mm -hmm. in the screenplays she wrote back in the 80s. But since you've read so widely, can you reflect on the idea of continuity that some writers show? Um, how does one develop that? Are there any particular favorites, favorite writers of yours who do show that? And on the flip side, are there writers you enjoy who do not show this quality, whose different books are almost like different animals? Beautiful question. And with Arundhati, I think her com continuity comes from the most uh, straightforward of places. A lot of people say that it's part of her personality or it's her politics, but I think it goes a lot deeper than that with her. It comes from her scale of values. It comes from a combination of her conscience, but also from just the way she sees the world. At some level, she's never lost the gaze that she had in God of Small Things, where even as a very young child, and she was writing from the perspective of a young child, this child registering a lot of the injustice and the turmoil and the upheaval and the love in the world, all of them together. I don't think she's ever lost a single one of those. So it's not that her subject would be Kashmir or her subject would be uh, the state as such. Instinctively, as a writer, I think her sympathy is always, always with the individual. And by that, I mean not just the individual against the state as a type, but there's something in her that just strikes out for, we are not just an amorphous mass, we are not just voices in the crowd. Um, it is what makes her special, the fact that when she, whether you agree with her or disagree with her, when she went and covered the Narmada Valley agitation um, and that entire movement, she didn't cover it in a dry and abstract way. I don't think she's capable of writing that way. She sees everything that happens, including politics, as something that creates the environment and the, around people that changes their lives intimately. You know, so you can't say that it's as simple as her sympathies are with people who are suffering or people who have suffered injustice. It's more like she instinctively gravitates to people whose stories are not told, but who have trusted her with their stories. And that's the common thread all through. So when I read her, of course, uh, the novels, particularly the first one, really works for me. But I don't see that much of a blurring, blurring line between fiction and nonfiction. I think the reason that you cast things in one form rather than the other has less to do with them being different countries, if you like. You know, they're more like neighboring houses. And uh, the second part of your question was writers who do dazzlingly different things. Often they writers who appear to do dazzlingly different things stylistically. You know, one of them, um, I was thinking of Bernard, uh, is Bernard Shaw a good example? No, he's too old. I'm just going to take one quick look at my uh, bookshelves. Uh, among the contemporary uh, scientific uh, science fiction writers, for example, look at Neil Gaiman. You know, he's such a classic case in point. He starts off with comics, and then he moves to mythology. He 
uh, writes short stories and he writes children's stories. But even in that dazzling range, you know, that's a huge technical range. But you will find a common thread. You will find that people's obsessions come from the core of them. And you're always, wherever you move to, you're carrying that around with you. I hope that helps. Right. Thank you. Uh, Parag is next. Parag, can you raise your hand? Yeah, great. So I'll just make Parag. you a panelist. Hi, Parag. Hi, Jyotin. Yes. So uh, uh, I've been spending the past few days on your website reading up uh, the articles that you've been writing. I really enjoyed those, uh, specifically the one around uh, you know getting a seat at the table, uh, which I thought was very powerful. It was really something that I, I liked a lot. Uh, my question is around um, you know when you review a book, right? What are the axes on which you basically try and and review it, right? So whether it is the content, the past work of the author. how he's carried the story through and things like that i'm trying to get a understanding of that um, so that i can kind of take it back and apply it to the books that i read so that i can get more enjoyment out of those so that's that's really uh, my my question i have to say that often my reviews are not review essays they written for newspapers so the first thing that i'm mindful of is basically how to compress a lot into a very short uh the, you, you know span of words typically we don't get more than about 700 to 800 words but within that the one rule that i have for myself when i'm reviewing is uh, do not try to blurb uh the reader can look up the plot of the book at any point of time and that's not what you're there for if i have time and even when i don't i do try to read ideally whatever that writers uh written before and this of course they have 20 novels that i haven't you know previously been able to read but i will try to get a sense of the range i, I don't do that just as a mechanical exercise i do that because when you come across a writer's work you should be able to at least some level be a little respectful of the life that they spend spent in writing okay i want to be able to place that but also it's not um, if you pick up a writer like a uh, graham green or if you pick up um, name a contemporary writer whom you like let's see whether we can uh, elena ferrante okay let's take elena ferrante you could read all the books that she's written but ideally you would also take a quick look at what other contemporary italian novelists are doing and get a little sense of what other european writers might be doing if you're looking at sense of place on one hand um the when i reviewed ferrante i also looked at labor reports because a lot of her work has to do not just with you know women's lives or friendship a lot of her work is focused around work and you really want to start getting a sense of that so um the axis around which i review there isn't a there isn't a report card it isn't a pass fail grade or whatever but typically i will look at what the author sets out you know you try to meet the author on their ground and you say all right what are you trying to do with this book if it's experimental if you have multiple chapters out of order what is it that you're trying to convey with that you know what are you trying to make me not just feel but think about experience you know what is all of that about books are really representative often they are treated as though this is the great african novel this is the great nigerian or cameroonian novel and often what the writer is writing about is people people stuck in difficult and troubling circumstances i tend to look at character and voice uh, very very strongly and that indefinable thing that we call style as well uh if a book's going to be successful then it will have a mix of all of these elements you know uh but most of all at the end of it it's not even a judgment scale uh there's all of this there's if you like uh think of it in terms of concentric circles so you have the book you have the book and what the author's written you have where the author is located and this could be along any axis it could be along gender as well as geography for example and you could and you have the music of the book the voice of it the poetry of it or the lack of poetry of it whichever you know and then you have the characters 
you have the plot, the narrative, all of that. But in the end, it's down to intuition. What is the relationship between you and the book, reader to book? That point is when a review comes from there, it usually comes from a clean space. Because at that point, actually, even the writer is not involved. Every time you pick up a book, you might pick it up being aware of the reputation of the writer, but you meet the book on its own terms. Story is either alive for all time or it's dead. Usually there isn't a free house. There's a lot of novels that uh, particularly get there, you know, up to a certain point. Maybe they'll be 70% almost there. Failures are interesting. I've never judged a book uh, for failing as such. You can have a book that's a grand mess, but that still makes its point. You know, the book that won the Booker, for example, it's not perfect by any uh, yardstick, Shuggy Benz. It's long and all of that, but there is something about it. It has a heart. And I think that ultimately carries the day. I hope that answers your question. Are you looking at book reviewing yourself, Parag? No, no, no. I, I just want to maximize the enjoyment that I can get from reading a book. <laughs> <laughs> how lovely. Yeah. How, how, how absolutely lovely. Thank you. Okay, Bridgesh is coming on as panelist. He knows the drill. Hi, Bridge. Hi, Nilanjana. This is a question from my friend Ritu. Uh, so she wanted to ask how to avoid my feminine gaze both during reading and writing. Oh, I see. The question is basically, you know, uh, inverting the whole thing of how do I avoid my masculine gaze, which is uh, frequently uh, what we're looking at in terms of uh, upsetting the traditional main canon and stuff like that. Yeah. My yes. answer to this is, why would you want to? Why would you want to self-consciously avoid any kind of filter at all? Be aware of it and don't operate from it if that's the way you want to roll. Uh, but there's no need to avoid it or turn it off. Let me expand on this a little bit. It depends on if you're reading a piece of writing, is it intrinsically gendered? Is it the writer's gender that matters? Is it the writer's assigned gender at birth or the writer's gender identity? Uh, is a book more feminine because it deals with the lives of women? Is it more masculine because it deals with apparently male characters, even if the book is entirely about their love lives with women? You know? This is wonderfully complicated territory. And uh, I think we carry gender with us, whether we like it or not, because it is so strongly forced on us wherever we go. We are looking at this panel and we're instinctively saying, oh, that's a man talking to Ninanjana, Ninanjana is a woman. You know, it's very difficult to break out of those. So be aware that that's what you're bringing to a text. And uh, don't avoid it, interrogate it, ask um, does the experience of being a woman change the way you're looking at a novel? If so, is that a valid way to read? If you read Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita as a woman, are you reading it as a woman or as a reader from a gender neutral space inside your head? If you're reading it as a woman, are you more likely than a man to identify with the nymphet, who is basically the rape victim, you know, basically the child rape victim? If you're reading it as a man, are you really going to identify completely with Humbert Humbert? I don't know. Get, I would say wade into it and get complicated and get, you know, let it be messy. Life is messy. Thank you, Narendra. You're welcome. And uh, for my question, um, I, uh, for one, uh, do think I would like to review uh, because... Uh, in, in my journey, uh, mainly through Twitter has been a great place for me to meet uh, like-minded people. And uh, they have been great guides for me, right? But before the before Twitter, it was newspaper and all where we had uh, reviewers and critics. And generally, while everyone seems to love to criticize the critics, I don't see yet a better way to find uh, gems without them uh, going through the whole morass of it and telling us, right? So... 
when i when when i took did the writing course one of the things i realized is i'm really not writing that much more but i'm reading a lot more and because these are all my friends from the course i tend to want to see what is it that i can uh, give input that can make their work even better and uh, it is slightly simpler because at least i know their tone i know what is the kind of thing they want to project and i feel safe it's a safe space within this uh, cohorts here but when uh, when a person like you is writing in a newspaper where you have such a huge audience how do you protect yourself from losing connection to that audience you know how do you make uh, things uh, find things that are important to them and how do you scale it uh, to the the scale of an audience of a newspaper this one's a tricky one actually because if you're too self conscious if you remain aware that you are reaching half a million readers you know then you freeze at self right or you'll get self conscious to the point where you start to lecture at them or get really pompous or something like that yeah yeah um i never write for an ideal reader as such i write kind of into a darkness um i'm never sure who out of that half million is going to read it and dismiss it or read it and engage with it or read it and hate it and it's a wonderful feeling to realize that you are only responsible for doing your job but you're not responsible for the reactions out there it always matters down to the story my fidelity is to whatever it is whether i'm writing about democracy or free speech or whether i'm writing a book review my fidelity is first and foremost to the subject where the reader comes in is i have an obligation when i write for the newspapers particularly um the piece must have its integrity it must have heart and it must have clarity those three things i'd never want to write lazy even though once in a while of course you do you know in the daily grind of uh, writing week after week or fortnight after fortnight but i really believe that you have a duty to try to write as freshly as you can you have a duty to whatever is going on in your life leave it on the mat outside your study when you start writing and write with heart and freshness and you'll be fine it doesn't matter whether you're writing for just five readers or whether you're writing for half a million readers in the end does the audience matter yes but you yeah I, sorry so i was going to ask the same thing about the audience yeah i think it depends on where your audience is on twitter for example um technically huge audience i have something like i've forgotten uh, 200000 followers or something like that i don't know them and twitter can very rapidly you know uh, it, it can get a little emotional let's, <laughs> let's put it that way <laughs> yes so 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 i'm a little more aware on twitter of how to phrase things so that uh, if i'm being provocative at least i need to be deliberately provocative you know and if i get into a fight then i need to be aware it's not fair for somebody who has apparently so many followers on twitter uh to get into a huge fight with somebody who's new to twitter and has only 50 followers you know it's it it's it's really not right you know correct it it puts a little thing on you but i never feel when i'm writing i never feel like i'm addressing an audience somewhere in that mass there will be just readers there will be people saying yes you know this is something i agree with or disagree with and eventually when you're connecting whether you're writing a book or whether you're writing a piece in the paper you're writing for millions of anonymous people who aren't anonymous in themselves they're individuals in themselves and you just try to reach them some of them will find what you write from india for some of them it will be completely new it doesn't matter you just try to do justice to it that's it i hope that helps yes it it does it does thank you very much nilanjana thank you amit um Uh, so sunilanjana so, you know you just showcase the writer's craft by calling twitter emotional which is such a lovely way to describe <laughs> them you know all of twitter will now be saying ki nilanjana ne to rula diya amit is always calling us toxic but now nilanjana has called us emotional oh, wow so we we'll move on I, if you remember that song i was thinking of emotional atyachar <laughs> there is quite a lot of emotional atyachar that happens on twitter there is a lot of atyachar i cannot dispute that uh, we uh, our, our next question is from uh, saurabh it said saurabh is now becoming a panelist and uh, then he just disappeared 
disappeared into the ether maybe there's a mystery novel here maybe somebody actually disappears like this in real life during a zoom call in the transition from attendee to panelist and ends up wandering in cisco webex right <laughs> yeah his body webex. is found on cisco webex <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay sorob is back i'm muting myself so sorob go ahead hi sorob thanks to see you lanjana thank you for all your time here um it's a pleasure uh so uh writing is fairly new for me and um uh, uh i started up writing and i thought i had a lot of opinions and ideas to share is when i realized i had a lot to read and understand before i could churn something precisely and uh, i got started reading and something i realized i could do was review those books because communicating the main ideas of a writer at some point of time are equally important so um somewhere down the line uh, i was struggling uh, with finishing those books um getting those ideas out right so i thought you'd be the best person to help me know w- uh, how a writing a review is different from writing other forms such as uh, fiction or short stories or columns and uh, what are some uh, uh, methodologies or things one should keep in mind for instance one thing i struggle with is uh, do i finish the book completely uh, before i get started writing or do i keep uh, building up uh, the writing alongside as the book progresses okay there's two things that i would i really urgently want to say to you one is even if it's difficult don't let go of your own writing you know it takes a little time to figure out that's why i put curiosity up there as one of the first qualities that you need to pay attention to as a writer but ultimately when you become a writer it's because of this there's not even a need in you it's a response right it's one of the many ways that we have of really responding to the world and engaging with the world and the only way you're going to figure out what you really want to write about is by starting a little bit of your own writing you know you could do that in the form of a blog you could do that in the form of a little private journal even handwriting is a great way uh, to figure this one out and uh, you know just keep a list maybe of little ideas even if you don't develop them just a couple of lines a day about something that's caught your attention or something that you think at some stage you might want to develop into a short story a piece of fiction whatever <clears throat> one way in which fiction is slightly different from a review not slightly it's actually massively different from a review fiction is very much your own um you might be in service to the world that you're building you might be in service to the characters but fiction is your own space completely you get to decide everything from the voice to the form to the way that you're writing um each character how you present them uh your god in that little world when you're writing a book review there's a lot of leeway that you have within the form but there are certain conventions about it whether you should finish a book or not absolutely if you're going to review it even if you think you know where the author is going a lot of authors save their best conclusions for the last few chapters if you can't finish a book if you find that it's dragging and if that sense of dragging or having difficulty with it persists across many other books in that particular genre or that kind of writing then you're looking in the wrong direction that's not the book that you should be reviewing never force yourself to do that developing the discipline to finish a book is different from knowing whether this is a book that you want to review when you want to review a book parul segal at the new york times is one of the best contemporary reviewers we have uh she's a perfect example to me of the kind of writer who can on one hand pay attention to the book itself which is what you're supposed to be doing so you're looking to see a few things what is the main theme of the book uh what is the rough story arc right what is the deeper meaning of it what are the insights how do you come away changed from a book that's a very good point a place at which to start if you're reviewing fiction poetry any of those with non fiction it might be how does the book help you understand either a world that you thought you knew or a world that you absolutely don't know how does it introduce you to that world better 
how are you changed? You know, how is your understanding changed rather than how are you changed? Look at the books that you've been able to finish and that you don't even sweat about, right? And maybe those are the ones that you should be reviewing. Another thing that I'd like to explode out here, there is no such thing as a high book or a low book. If your instinct is putting you towards comics or something, comics are high art as well, you know? Follow that. Um, and the last bit, it helps to keep uh, making notes while you're reviewing a book. Uh, what I tend to do is to pull out quotes from the book itself. Or I tend to look at points where I've stumbled, where my attention is moving in a different direction and I ask myself, okay, what happened there? Or a point, conversely, where I'm deeply emotionally invested or intellectually engaged with what's going on, you know? And you make little notes about that and that note turns into, I wish I um, had a way of sharing with this with you. But one of the ways in which I plan a review often is like a fishbone structure. So I won't just trust to um, inspiration to get to the paragraph. I won't write a point size summary of each paragraph, but I'll write a set of themes, thoughts, whatever, and it moves like a fishbone, right? The spine of the review and the little things that might be a quote out here, that might be an observation out there, that might be something picked up from another book uh, that adds to that structure. When you put a structure like that in place, it sounds mechanical, but it's actually incredibly liberating. Once you know what you want to say through the uh, piece, a review shouldn't just be a dull summary of the book, right? A review should, in the 800 words or 1,000 words you're taking, it should uh, be more than just this is what the book is about. It should be a piece of writing compact in its own self. A little old fashioned now, but uh, there was a wonderful film reviewer called Pauline Kyle. And uh, remember that a review can start from anywhere. You don't have to start by introducing the book, the author and all of that. One of the um, liveliest reviews I read of a book was by Dom Mores, you know, who started off by talking about the Panthers of Mathura. And then from there, he made the connection. So a useful way to think about it is that fiction, when you're writing fiction, you're opening it out. It's a kind of portal into a world. And uh, when you're writing a review, it's a combination of an opinion, but you're also connecting whatever the book is to the wider world that we're in. I don't know whether this helps, but don't let go of the journal and don't let go of the things that you want to write. They might be tentative now, but just stick with it and see where it takes you. Good luck. Thank you. You know, it's, it's, it, it kind of struck me that no wonder that it is a Bengali writer who would come up with a fish bone structure for <laughs> writing a review. So, uh, you know, well done with that. And uh, so I, one of the questions that was submitted was by Prasanya Vigne, who I don't think is here, but it's about a related subject. So before we move on, I thought I should give him a chance to ask or ask on his behalf. So I'll ask Prasanna's question as uh, he isn't here and which is on knowledge management because you were just telling Saurabh mm -hmm. about the importance of taking <laughs> notes while you're reviewing. And I guess knowledge management is something broader than just reviewing in all your writing, you know, other, other nonfiction as well, especially for someone who reads a lot, it becomes an issue. And uh, Prasanna's question was, how do you retain what you learn and read? Does casual reading become mindful reading once you have a habit as rigorous as yours? Or do you, like Emerson, believe in assimilating knowledge instead of accumulating it? And then he quotes Emerson, a uh, quote, I cannot remember the books I've read any more than the meals I have eaten. Even so, they have made me uh, a stop quote. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that's Prasanna's question. Beautiful. I don't necessarily remember all of the books I've read. Certainly not. And there's a myth that reading a lot of books makes you a very smart person. It doesn't. It makes you a very bookish person. <laughs> but over time, if you spend a lifetime in anything, you know, whether that's uh, reading or like J.R. Arjun Singh, our fellow blogger in uh, watching films, you learn a lot about that particular world and you learn a lot about your own interests. So a lot of the books that stayed with me were surprising to me because they opened me my sense of self up to interests I didn't know were interests. I did not know that 
nature or meditation or cooking or the lives of trees. I didn't know I cared so deeply about these until I found myself buying more and more books and reading them. Uh, how knowledge management I could practically teach an entire seminar on this one or learn from somebody who would teach me that. But I have several ways of trying to manage this. One is uh, when I'm traveling somewhere or one of the things I like to do when I'm researching a book about characters who are very different from me is I like to walk around uh, if it's set in this time in a city like Delhi. I like to walk around areas that I don't know and take photographs. And eventually those photographs will be married to historical maps so that I can see how much change has happened in an area over a period of time. I also look at things like gazettes. I look for oral uh, archives reports and I'll collect all my research in either index cards or tiny little journals and put them together in a gigantic cardboard box. By some mysterious coincidence, by the time the cardboard box is filled, I'm usually ready to start writing the book. In a more serious way, um, I think all through my career as a journalist, I was lucky enough to have mentors who introduced me to different ways of researching and archiving and keeping records. We were just talking before uh, this wonderful session began, and Amit mentioned that with the seen and the unseen, the transcripts run to something like three million words. So the trick is to do enough research and keep enough records uh, so that you can keep going, but not be daunted by this not drown in the amount of research or the, the volume of things. It's always at some point you'll be able to find a way to extract yourself from that. Research, just a side note out here, I think it's essential to any kind of writing that you do. There was a beautiful course taught by the writer Annie Dillard, who's known uh, as a wonderful writer about the surprising savagery of nature. But she also was a teacher. And she used to teach people how to approach their own city. I assume that you're, uh, everyone on this uh, panel is either from Bombay or from metros by and large. Uh, they're from all over, actually. So, yeah. I, okay. okay. It's a diverse bunch. So, let's take cities as an example. We always assume that we know our own cities. I grew up in Calcutta. I was born in Calcutta and then came to Delhi. And I assume that I know both from memory and from experience. But what you really know at that point of time is uh, really just your memory and just your experience. It's only when you start uh, researching, and that's everything from maps at the most basic level, maps show you how much a city has changed over time. When you get into district records and stuff like that, a whole new world opens up. Organizing that is, um, it really depends on how much time you have to spend on any specific thing. One of my reviews took me something like two months to research, you know, but it was a long review essay involving about three or four different books. And I just needed that time to go into the history of a book that had been translated by four different translators before and how each translation varied in each decade. I knew I wasn't going to use 90% of that material, but the 10% that you use that really makes your piece shine. It's not even about impact. I think some of this, this is, not even about polishing a piece or finishing a piece. It's about two things that are connected. It's the joy of discovering something about a subject that you think you know, right? And it's, uh, it's about respect for the world itself. It's about saying that our understanding is limited, but we can deepen that by either asking people, having the humility to know that what you think you know of something is not the end point. And often that's uh, been the best part of the job. Often I've looked at my notes and tried to, you know, uh, at the Financial Times, I have a track record for, they're all like, you know, Nilanjana, the space doesn't expand. The column is 750 to 800 words. And I'll start off by thinking, what do I write about uh, Kipling all over again and the second Jungle Book? And then I'll open up Kipling's memoirs and discover or be reminded that he wrote about the Indian jungles when he was sitting in Vermont, looking out at a completely different landscape. And then I say, okay, so when was he in the jungles of Madhya Pradesh? You do a little more research and you realize, my God, the man was never in the jungles of Madhya Pradesh. He knew what an Indian jungle looked like, but he got all of his research from a little slim book about hunting, fishing, and shooting 
written by a board uh, district officer who had nothing to do and who is in the boondocks. <laughs> you know, it's so you look at all of that and you think, okay, so that's why the Jungle Book seem both very true to life. Um, you know that every detail that he's bringing to you about the snakes and the tigers are true because somebody else made that the truth. But at the same time, it's also why it seems at a little bit of a distance. And then you understand there's a little flash of understanding and you think, could somebody who really knew the jungles well and who'd grown up in them and walked around in them do a better job? And then Stephen Alter, who's grown up in the Himalayas and who knows the jungles around Corbett really well, takes a shot at writing the second jungle book. And you have to read it to see whether he it worked. Well, that's that's fascinating. And you can't berate Kipling too much because you only said that, uh, you know, imagination is a skill that we can all develop. So what if he hadn't visited the jungles? He used his imagination. Uh, and, you know, and I wish you hadn't mentioned the fact that I have three million words to go through uh, off the scene and the unseen. But you spoke about drowning and that brought to my mind one of my favorite phrases in poetry. So we don't have commercials. We can't take a commercial break, but we'll take a quick poetry break while I read out one of these, one of my favorite poems, which, uh, you know, by the great Stevie Smith. So I'm sure you know which one it is, uh, Nilanjana. And uh, here we go. Not waving but drowning by Stevie Smith. Nobody heard him, the dead man, but still he lay moaning. I was much further out than you thought and not waving but drowning. Poor chap, he always loved locking and now he's dead. It must have been too cold for him, his heart gave way, they said. Oh, no, 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 it was too cold always. Still the dead one lay moaning. I was much too far out all my life and not waving but drowning. And with that indulgent digression, we'll move on to the next question, which is from uh, uh, Mridumesh. Hey, Mridumesh, uh, can you? Yeah, Hi. Okay. Hi. I'll mute myself. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Uh, How are you? Hi, Nilanjana. Uh, very well. You know, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, very happy to be here and have this opportunity. You, you know, the investment, the small investment in Amit's uh, class has had, you know, such high ROIs, you know, I can't describe. Uh, you know, uh, my question to you was from uh, the publishing and, you know, your reviewer, uh, reviewer hat. Uh, and my question was, you know, a um, lot of contemporary Indian writing is now in English, at least, you know, what we are getting exposed to. And, you know, to me, it sounds like, you know, just like Bollywood has become, you know, all aspirational NRI types and, you know, very, very elite and therefore lost touch with the masses. Uh, you know, so similarly, is Indian literature also facing the same trap? And can that be one of the reasons that, you know, today the intellectuals, you, you know, uh, especially the socio-economic, socio-political writers are losing their influence with, with the general public? Okay. Two completely different things, though. You know, I would say about Indian English. Indian English has now become pretty much one of India's languages. You know, English has been around... Uh, in the country for more than 200 years and we've taken it over fully. You know, whether you're looking at Chetan Bhagat uh, at one point or Michael Mudur Shudan Dotto on the other, at some point, Abnadia, yeah, the language is out. But what you're talking about is a debate that comes up so often because what we see is that not within India. Within India, there are writers in every major Indian language, you know, whether it's Hindi, Bengali, Tamil, Telugu, a Gujarati, Marathi, who command not just vast audiences of their own in their own right, but they have the kind of connect with their readers often that an Indian writer in English can only envy. You see, because there's a double rooting often. Uh, with English, you'd exchange the fact that English is a kind of cross-country language for the fact that English is not rooted anywhere. There's no birthplace of English in India. There's no state that speaks only English the way that we speak Ahomiya or something of the sort, right? So it's not that those writers don't exist. They do exist. They have large following, particularly when you're talking about pulp fiction. I would say that the, uh, a lot of the Indian regional languages, Malayalam, Bengali, etc., their pulp fiction writers outsell are puny, you know, tens of thousands of copies by a wide margin. What we're really talking about is power in the global marketplace. And this is something that we have been, I think, trying to push back uh, about for years where Western agents and publishers are concerned. The Western market tends to see English first, which is all right, I guess, since that is an English language market. 
but when they see english only then that's like reading all of european literature through the lens of only french you know it's only recently that you see a tiny little bit of a tilt though in every decade we've had our hopes up uh, i see writers like vivek shanbhag or perumal murugan getting a certain kind of attention that still leaves out a whole bunch of writers from krishna sobhi to shivani who are never going to be uh, you know make that leap abroad so it's a lopsided gaze it it really is is this the reason if you are talking about the shrinking influence of the english language opinion maker i think a lot of that has to do actually with how the media landscape has changed and it's not the opinion maker per se it's a shrinking space for the influence of the media economist in general and let me toss the question back at you except for maybe ravish kumar and a couple of others who are the wildly influential columnists in indian languages outside of english when newspapers have that kind of wide circulation i can't think of too many i think our discourse is set by tv much more than it is by the media you know but to answer part of your question i think what we traded off at some point the original uh, writers in english the original editors and intellectuals in english and this was true for about 150 years at least very few of them were only english speakers yeah most of them when they started out came to english but they also were very much at home in some other indian language they were mod one way or the other and both mukul kesavan and ram guho ramchandra guho have written eloquently about this that look what we are losing is really the bilingual in- intellectual you can't belong to a country like india and be if you your entire reading writing speaking is only in english i love this language as much as anybody else i write in it partly because i don't have the guts to write in bengali you know i have the same hesitation about how can i stand with asha putna devi and mohshita devi and the rest of them but uh, i think that is really the single biggest difference if you're talking about political change that's a much much wider subject but we can get into it if you want to thank you thanks thanks a lot and you know we wish there were more like sir joshi and but you know probably is the medium the change of medium which has uh, created a new breed of uh, uh, you know influencers thank you yeah i'm back i'll just uh, uh, say namaste to uh, nidumesh <laughs> which i have managed to do uh, and uh, anirban had a very interesting question about the emotional journey of actually embarking upon uh, the process of writing so i'll promote him to a panelist now hi anirban hi nilanjana how are you doing fine it's so nice to see everyone indeed it is uh, because we rarely see see each other Yeah, so I just wanted to know um, how does one write long novels in terms of? I often wonder whether writing a long novel involves a journey within for the writer in terms of an emotional journey, and like if you're just about publishing a new book now in the next year or so, how you how did you feel when you were writing long form? How, how did something change within you? did you realize something about yourself it was a transformation it really was and i probably spent about 20 25 years as a writer of sorts before that you know being a blogger or writing for the newspapers even trying um my hand at slightly longer essays yeah what i didn't realize when i not so much with the wildings and hundred names of darkness which took a few years to come together in my mind but the writing of that didn't take such a long time you know it took a long while for the world of those books to build for me to get to know deadly and not just cats but to see a city where some of its most vulnerable inhabitants were still out there having fun and making friendships and all of that yeah that was a bit of a journey but it's the novels that i'm working on now that were really transformational because it started with getting to know the characters and uh, i admire writers who can get under the skin of a character very fast and get into it very swiftly it actually took me years because i was writing about people whom i had to understand um without 
any real lived knowledge of their lives you see um a lot of their lives revolved around the importance of work or they had constraints and freedoms that i knew nothing about and i spent a lot of time trying to get into this through research uh and that was the wrong way i really i think my characters waited patiently for me until i got to know them as people until i'd spent approximately the same length of time that you would spend with a good friend and then maybe you have the right to write about them a lot of people say a novel takes stamina and it takes dedication what's hard for us to explain is that a novel feels alive when you're writing it technically speaking it's a massive challenge uh you're wrestling with a beast and there was one time i remember uh, one year when i was sitting in goa at a friend's place and you know wrestling with a particularly tricky set of chapters and a friend of mine who was a painter among the many other things she did she said you novelists have a very difficult life i start off as on a series of paintings and it takes me a little while to get into it but in 3 months i'm done and i have six paintings and um, for a moment i contemplated going to the mandovi and throwing myself in because you know what is this life i have chosen <laughs> but the rewards of it are also huge what happens is that over a period of time you grow to love the world the universe that you're in it's so different from what you know but you created it your inside and outside it simultaneously and i think what i've been wrestling with for the last 4 or 5 months is not anything to do with the technical difficulty of writing the last few chapters doing the last few edits it is really a kind of sadness um i don't believe unlike a few people a uh, few writers they believe that their characters are alive as such i know very well that i created my characters that i'm never going to sit down with them at the table but they have a life to them right and when you're nearing the end of a novel you're both relieved because you want this off your desk you want this to go out into the world or at least just leave you right you've been living inside it too long and at the same time there's such sadness because uh, these are the last months that i've been spending with them you know and after this uh, the goodbye is a final goodbye in a way that it isn't with a friendship on this that ends with death or something like that as it is that i really will never spend time with them again in this way i really never will go back to the yamuna in the 1990s again i'll move on to something else and you struggle a little you know it's time for it to go and i hope i don't this doesn't sound very precious but there's a huge emotional and uh, if i may say so there's a huge investment of the of your spirit more than your intellect you know and you don't know i think what i'm haunted by is a simple question have i done them justice i i don't know i have no way of knowing and even whether the book is praised or not is irrelevant you just don't know whether you've done their world justice whether you've been able to bring it to life the way it should be i hope that helps um so you spoke about your emotional journey when you were writing do you think this is something which every good writer experiences would you agree with that observation i don't know i don't know about good or bad but i think it does get easier with time you know this was these two books and it took me a long time <laughs> to see that they were two books and not one but these two books were the first time that i was trying to write uh, such a big cycle of stories involving human beings and so i was struggling with it over time it does get easier um what someone like um, you know for a lot of novelists what they understand is that whether it's tayari jones you know writing her books or bernadine everisto you understand that you will be spending about 3 4 years with the characters the place the scenario that you're creating it's a deep immersion right and it's a deep immersion into a world that is no less real because you created it you know to say that it's imaginary doesn't do it justice a lot of things that have a lot of weight on our lives are actually pretty much fiction you know um or fictional agreements but i think for every writer it doesn't always have to be an emotional loss but it is a deep deep immersion and after a while there's a trick to it you can train yourself to make the exit and the entry the exit from one book and the entry into another book i think what scares me a little bit is understanding that there's no cure to the 
sense of slight loss that you feel when you let go of a novel except to write another one. And all that you've taught yourself when you write a novel is how to write this particular novel. <laughs> you know, that information isn't helpful when it comes to writing the next set of short stories or writing whatever else you're going to write. Um, you have to learn, you have to pick up a new skill set. You need a new toolbox all over again. Thank you for asking that. Thank you so much for giving such a detailed answer to that. Thank you. Anirban ji, namaste. And <laughs> booted him off. Uh, no, Nilanjana, that's, you know, a, a couple of thoughts that struck me is one that when you speak of these imaginary worlds that you're living in, I guess there is a kind of argument that even the real world is an imaginary world because we are constructing everything about it in our heads and all our actual friends are imaginary friends. So what are we to do with uh, uh, that? And I remember uh, our friend Saman Subramaniam was on my show, The Seen and the Unseen, speaking about narrative nonfiction. And he pointed out that when he finished his book on JBS Haldane, he felt as if someone close to him had died because... He was letting yeah. go of the character. Raj, you had a couple of questions on uh, writing. So uh, can you raise your hand so mm -hmm. then I can make you a panelist once again? Uh, okay. So Ilanjana, when you wrote on the Kavya Vishwanathan plagiarism case, mm -hmm. you'd spoken of the case of uh, Ellen Eggman, the 17-year-old writer whose book had incorporated lines and passages from several other writers, which she did not deny. Uh, but in fact, just said that attribution is unimportant because she's remixed the material in a way that mm -hmm. makes it her own. While writing about this, you had said that Hegemon's uh, generation brought up on the mashup culture will challenge the sanctity of authorship. Mm -hmm. Now, it's been a more than a decade since uh, uh, Hegemon, the whole situation that happened. Can you elaborate on what you meant by people challenging the sanctity of authorship? And is it a good thing or a bad thing? Have you seen examples of that around us? I don't think you see it that much in conventional publishing because there we are still sticking to the idea that a book is authored by one author or collaboratively authored by several. But I see it everywhere around me in the wider written culture. You know, I see it uh, I, most of all in music where a line can be tossed around for generations between one rap song and another. You know, not just a line, but a refrain. It's almost as though they'll be talking to each other. A uh, little example of something that's not uh, verbal. But yesterday, there was this video doing the rounds on the internet, you know, of an Italian singer who had made up a nonsense uh, English song and uh, was performing it in classic style. Okay. We took one look at the song and it was actually pretty good, even though it was nonsense English. And he basically made it up to prove to Italian audiences that they would uh, love any song that sounded like that it was in English. But actually, you know, what made it work was that it was the James Brown riff. So you see these things, you see these little, you know, flows in and out of each other. And you see a generation out here. I suspect that when it comes to publishing, publishing is still, publishing invented the term hidebound, right? So publishing is still hanging on to the whole convention of one author. But um, I'm trying to remember her name, and I should because she's quite well known, and uh, she's also a Canadian writer whom uh, I've met. Uh, but there's a young Canadian Indian writer who did a story for The New Yorker some time back, which was basically took an existing short story and the only thing it flipped about it was the race of the people. Wow. And it became hugely controversial. There were writers from Francine Prose to others saying that this was plagiarism. But it wasn't. It was a very clear experiment. And how could she claim authorship? Because at that point, it goes in much more into the territory of something like installation art. Because you have changed perspective. You're the first one who came up with this idea. So these things are always going to be a little bit at war at this point. I think someone like Bernadine Everest, though, you know, since um, I, I loved Girls, Women, Other, I thought that was a phenomenal book. I think it's very difficult to say that you could mash up an Everest or a Ferrante or a Tayari Jones, you know. They have such particular voices. Uh, it would take a lot of skill to mash up a Carmen Machado again, you know, or Pascal Pitt, um, any of these poets or any of these people. But there's a case for saying that if publishing had been more open to this, I think we would have seen a lot more collaborative authors, authorship. And the one place where you see that happening and where it's been happening for years is in the romance novel industry, you know, where novels were frequently written by syndicates 
and nobody thought that was at all unusual. I think with writers, it's just that we are trained to think of ourselves as solo authors. But the classic uh, example of Naked Came the Stranger, or you know the story of the book that was written by a group of authors trying to basically send up and parody a certain kind of bestseller in America. Okay. And each writer, uh, they, they did an exquisite corpse on it. Each writer wrote a separate chapter. And the book ended up being a bestseller for a brief time. Basically, we can. We could do more mashups. We could do more collaborations. I could, I spent, am I, am I allowed a little uh, rant here? But I spent some time uh, reading a lot of uh, novels for prize juries, literary prize juries over the last few years, right? Okay. And there's a certain kind of novel that people are writing almost in a dutiful way. I don't mean that there aren't brilliant writers breaking out of this generation. There are the Roshan Ali's, there's Annie Zedi, there's Amitabh Bhakti, a host of other people. But I often think that there's some people who have got into writing because they think this is what you should do. You know, like lawyer, doctor, book a winner. And <laughs> no offense meant because that is, a, after all, an aspiration. But the moment that you want to write to something, you want to write the self-consciously literary novel, you've lost me. It, it was painful. But it had one advantage. By the end of doing my third prize jury uh, reading list, Ask me to do a mashup of the Indian literary novel in English, and I can. I don't think I can. <laughs> Sorry, that is evil. But um, mashup culture, I think it's arrived everywhere else. You see it in fashion, you see it in music, you see it definitely in uh, graffiti, in you know, informal art much more. Uh, we are still resistant, but I don't know how long that will last. Right. I had one more question. Uh, I wanted to ask about The Girl Who Ate Books because so many of the essays in the book were written in completely different contexts. So can you tell us about the process of putting together a book of essays? How do you recontextualize? Do you, how did you plan the structure? What all did you revisit? What, what did you leave uh, unchanged? Yes. And what were the joys and challenges of writing a book that came together on the editing table? The Girl Who Ate Books is uh, one of my most beloved failures, you know. And I think of it as a failure because it's so obvious when you read that book that I was going in two directions. It started off when Krishan Chopra, who is a publisher, said, why don't you collect the columns that I was writing for the business standard? So I had them on the computer. I took a look at them and I did not think that they would work as they stood, you know. So many columns are just written for into that time. And it's not just that you're writing on a deadline, but you're writing for the page and for the day and for the week, you know. And uh, as a reader, you can smell that. You have to be a really good columnist to get away with a wall-to-wall -wall collection of your columns, and I'm not in that week. But I did see that the columns had specific themes in common. So that's where I started to put them together and just knock together an informal... A, a kind of light-hearted history of Indian writing in English as it stood. Uh, then we discovered that there was what I think of as the Kitri section. You know, there were the small interviews with writers that I'd done. And at that time, we tossed it in as Feda, but I'm so glad that we did. Um, one of the problems with Indian writing in general, but and definitely in English, is that we keep forgetting our own history. So we don't have a culture of preservation, Right. Uh, with Krishna Sopti, who preserves her notebooks, uh, who preserves her writing process, by and large, we don't have a culture of asking each other questions about craft. In English, we do a little self-consciously, but not in other streams and languages. And that ended up being something like a memory wall. I'm only sorry that because we decided it was going to be more about Indian writing in English, we did have to leave out about uh, 25 interviews with writers from other languages, and that's where it feels incomplete to me. But the last part of the book that surprised me was the personal essays. I did not expect to be writing personally, and it just grew organically. I, I think that is part of the problem about writing about books and a life in reading. You don't want to be self-indulgent. Who is interested in your life and your childhood memories? But as a reader, it is personal. And 
and I didn't know it then, but I was taking my first steps to becoming a writer, and somehow that got recorded in a muddled way. The only reason why I think the book isn't a complete failure, because it goes all over the place, as you can see. You know, it's a bit of a mishmash. It, it requires the reader's indulgence. But I've now met several people who found it useful to them when they stepped into writing, and if it's doing that, then at least I'm grateful for something. The other thing I'm glad about is that inadvertently it captured a certain time in publishing in Delhi, a world that's almost dead and gone now, you know, when the publishers sat in Darya Ganj in very non-palatial uh, rooms and the moment you went up the stairs, you were risking your life one of two ways. Either the stairs could, uh, they were wooden stairs and termite eaten and one of those days the termites were going to win. Or you'd reach there and duck your head under a low door frame in one of those, you know, uh, squeezed Darya Ganj publisher's quarters and a tower of books would promptly fall on your head. One way or the other. This is what happens. A life in reading is dangerous. Books will get you. <laughs> it's a book that urged me to revisit a lot of writing. So a lot of books. So, I'm so glad uh, I, to hear I certainly that. don't see Thank it you. as a failure. Thank you so much. Thanks. That's kind. Namaste, Raj. That's a uh, delightful image of books uh, falling on a writer and, you know, dying by literature, as it were. A uh, lovely way to go. One common question that Mahima Vashisht has asked, which keeps coming up, and I'll elaborate on that as well. First, I'll read out what she submitted. Quote, what would your advice be for folks, particularly aspiring writers with full-time day jobs, who can only make an hour or two to read a day? In other words, how to make the best of reading if you can't go high on quantity? Should you try to pick a lane, the kind of books you enjoy and go deep into those kind of books? Or should you make a conscious effort to expose yourself to as much variety as possible? Stop quote. That's Mahima's question about how do you make time for reading? And I'll actually add to that and point out that, you know, when you uh, sort of... Um, when we started this conversation, uh, you gave an excellent piece of advice that, listen, you, you, you know, uh, you need freedom to write. Some of that freedom comes from money. Have a day job and then make time to write. But a common question that I often get is that, look, I have a day job, but you know what day jobs are like these days. You know, how do we get the time to write? How do we kind of uh, manage that? So do you have any, uh, any, any thoughts on that? I understand how tough it was. One of the reasons why I became a writer late is because I honestly didn't have the energy. You know, uh, once you were done with, uh, I, I used to also handle the, not handle, but help handle the desk production at Outlook and at Business Standard. And once you were done with the production shift, you were going to go back home and sleep for two days because you'd been up till five in the morning, so, so many days running, plus your own writing, plus your own editing, right? But I think time and money is a perpetual problem. When it comes to reading, let's get to that first. I think it does make sense to pick and choose what you're going to be reading wisely and carefully, especially, you know, have something like a year planner and read the, you know, book recommendation lists or read trusted critics or listen to podcasts and pick up your recommendations from there and target lightly, you know, but um, if you're reading maybe one book a month, you're doing well. And that means that you're only going to be reading 12 books a year. So absolutely, absolutely pick a name. I would say of those 12 books, see whether you can divide it up. It sounds mechanical, but it does help. Uh, two books or three books about a subject that you already know about and you want to deepen your interest in. Three books from the must read uh, the big books of the year list. Three books, I insist on this, three books from the past or from another language. Those are the take you out of your comfort zone. And another three books you must read on something that is completely unfamiliar to you, you know? So just, or read in a genre that you normally wouldn't. Just see something might spark off and give yourself permission to let it go if it doesn't work. How to make time for the writing there's only one way that works, and it's the Toni Morrison route, and she did it when she was a full-time editor at Random House, plus had kids to bring up, so what's your excuse? Hello. You know, it's, uh, she's not the only one who did it. Mary Oliver did it as well uh, in the years before. Mary Oliver was the poet, uh, the one who, you know, gave you the two bits of advice that you need. Be astonished, tell about it, and you do not have to walk on your knees 
no one ever does um mary oliver also had a very very tough life for the early part of her poetry writing career and both of them were wise enough to use the morning hours i know that's difficult particularly for people who have kids uh, and have to get the kids off to school and have all of that rushing it is tough but if you can make yourself get up at 4:35 all you need to do is 500 words of writing a day 500 to maximum 1000 that's it at the end of 6 months you have enough for half a book you can take another 6 months finish that book and then take another 6 months and edit it and revise it you know but you will get there rushing into it trying to open up vast swatches of time that's really hard that's really hard and then once you have that time you've got to have the discipline to actually sit there and write and not as certain writers me or me not have done abandon some of the editing in order to go out and picnic in the park with kids playing football this is not a confession or an invention of any sort the point about writing is it is always hard but writers who are very successful people from shidhat mukherji uh, you know to benokri what they have on their plate is the problems of success somebody always wants them to do an interview or write an extra piece or sign 50 books or do the book festival do the book talk book, do the book tour they have busy schedules as well you're always fighting for time and the only question that really matters is not where is the time going to come from books have a way of dying and moving elsewhere if you don't write them this is a story nobody would imagine is true and it has a lineage to it it happened to ann patchett and elizabeth gilbert wrote about it with ann patchett a point of time when she was working on gilbert was working on a book idea and it was a very specific kind of book idea and then as happens with stories the line went dead and she decided not my story not my idea let go of it three years later she bumps into ann patchett for the first time at a writers conference they get on really well and they're sitting and chatting and she says so ann what are you working on this when you know this idea came to me pretty much in the middle of the night and it sounded interesting and it's about xxx a hitchhiker this gilbert staring at her and she said you know something i abandoned a book like that it's a moment silence and then patchett and gilbert have this fascinating conversation about the fact that ideas are not as unique as you think you start tapping into this source and it's not that you're being unoriginal but in a mysterious way we don't understand they keep moving around so i haven't told the author of this book this story even though i interviewed her because i didn't want to you know the the interview had to be about her but about 5 years back i abandoned the butcher thriller book and i thought i should really try to write a book that is more about contemporary india's problems and i got about 15 pages in and it just wasn't singing you know instinctively when a book is not on song something about it the idea was good it involved a young girl who gets into a certain amount of trouble uh, with the law with the courts and that's as far as i got and i put it aside do you want to know what the title of it was please when the author i was interviewing was mekha majumdar and wow. <laughs> i went back to my uh, chest of drawers and i pulled out that old file which i hadn't touched for 5 years and i opened it up and it says a burning <laughs> so you know if you don't want to do that book idea it will move around it will find somebody else you don't have to worry about it i think the only thing you do have to worry about is time because you don't realize how swiftly the years pass i know a lot of people particularly retired civil servants who are sitting there because they finally have the time at 65 70 and there are only a few keki daruwala kiran doshi who actually managed to sit down and write their books the rest of them pick up the pen and often discover that it's too late you know all the practice all the riyas all the sitting there and when you just drop it flowing through you that should have happened it's not available now it was sitting there waiting for them then so if you really love writing it is hard but it gets easier somehow miraculously when you make the time a little bit of time opens up to you but use the if not the first stars of the morning use the freshest stars that you can find you know afternoon break something give the work a little bit of time if you can't give it a lot of time but give it your best time it will appreciate that and 
in its own mysterious way. It's a little alive, and so it will return back to you. It does actually. Well, these are very inspiring words, and I hope uh, some of the people watching actually do get inspired and start getting up at four thirty in the morning. Uh, one final question, which everybody wants to uh, sort of uh, they've been haranguing me that you better ask this question and don't let her go without it, which is that can you recommend some books that you love for us to read? Books that give you joy, not great books that you must read or one of those things, but which are the books that have brought you the most joy in your life and you'd like to share with us? Joy. This is, it's so funny, but a lot of them, I think, would be what would be considered children's books. I separate the author from the writing, you know, that question about authorship. I don't take the author that seriously. I cannot get over the fact that Harry Potter gave me that much happiness for so many years. Uh, three other books almost in a row, and they're going to start tumbling out because this is what happens with book recommendations. Surprisingly, Pothe Panchadi. You know, uh, the book that Satyajit Ray made into a film. It's not considered a conventionally happy book. But what happens in that book, a boy discovering the world, discovering that the world is larger than his village, coming to the world after tremendous loss, and then facing another loss, and still finding a way to move on. And that book has run in my bloodstream for I don't know how many years. The Wizard of Oz. I know that to kill a mockingbird is out of fashion now, but it was one of the. It was a threshold book. It was the kind of book when you read when you're still a child, but you're moving into adulthood. You know, I was about eleven or twelve when I picked that book up, and it um, it woke up an i an understanding in me that the world is not just, and the world can be cruel, but in the middle of that, a certain kind of decency might yet be found. You know. The most joyous books are not necessarily the ones that make me laugh. P. G. Woodhouse makes me laugh, but I don't think he would be on this list. And uh, do you notice something with this Miss Summit? The moment you say books that spark joy, the mind immediately goes back towards childhood or adolescence. You know, I, I think instinctively we don't reach for the funniest writers whom we've read in the last five, ten years. But um, oh no, I, I've got one. Um, Reading two books actually. One was the Hidden Life of Trees, and the other was the Robert McFarlane book on nature. And that sparked a kind of deep, deep pleasure and happiness because here was something that I had always known. You know that the world is bigger than us humans. That uh, everything has a life of its own. But I had never known the mechanics of how it worked, and I never really thought about it deeply. And here it was as a gift in my hands. A lot of the science books would spark joy to unusual ones. Um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. In my head, that's it's so strange. Um, that book is kind of partnered in my head with a lot of Tagore's darkest, most gothic tales, right? But and you wouldn't think it's about a monster and all of that. But what sparked joy was thinking of her. Being able to write it so completely at an age so young, and she was one of the first women writers to make me think. Even when I couldn't say writer with a capital W, I could say maybe someday I'll write my own story, and I did. Well, you know, and and uh, that, that uh, you know reminded me of this lovely book called Romantic Outlaws. I forget who the writer is, which is about uh, Mary Shelley and her mom, Mary Wollstonecraft. Mm -hmm. So it's a lovely book which kind of weaves their lives together. Uh, so a small little book recommendation for me at the end, uh, in case anyone's interested. Uh, Nilanjana, you've been so generous with your time and your insights. Uh, thank you so much. I hope at a future date, when you know one of the people attending this wins a Booker Prize or something, you know, writes that kind of novel, they will thank you in their uh, thank you speech. So, so, so once again, um, you know, uh, deep gratitude for uh, your taking the time out. Thank you so much. Well, this has been such a pleasure, and thanks for being so patient with me, Amit, and all uh, of you. You know. <laughs> Uh, marvelous questions and I just wish that this was face to face because that does change things and maybe someday we will have a chance to meet but thanks so much guys thank you